So I'd like to turn to Peggy at this point at WISE. Good morning, Peggy. Um, we'd love to hear from you about how the stay at home order has really changed the new normal for all of us here in New Hampshire. And we're doing so many things differently right now. Um, but could you talk specifically about how these safety measures and being at home have changed how WISE is providing services and specifically the work of advocates and what kind of new and innovative things you all are doing to meet the needs of survivors? Sure, thanks so much, Lynn, and hello, everyone. Good morning. It's sunny out, so we'll take that, right? It isn't snowing. Um, one of the things that um, I think is, is important to share is there's been a lot of work that crisis centers have done, and WISE in particular has done, to move to a remote platform to not only be available for people that want to be reaching out to us for the first time, but also to continue with the relationships that we had with survivors um, before we all went remote. WISE went remote nine weeks ago, and we were in a position to go remote. So for us, it was relatively smooth. We had some technology in place to be able to do it, which was very helpful. Um, including secure access to our server, which is at our program center in Lebanon. The other thing is we, um, our advocacy team works um, as a team. And so that team model was in place before we transitioned to remote access. And what's been key about that, and we call it the CAT team, the crisis and advocacy team, is that team model that we had in place helped us to transition to remote pretty, pretty quickly. What we're doing now to make sure that we are exchanging information and ensuring consistent and smooth response to survivors in the community and to partners is the advocacy team using Microsoft Teams is checking in first in the morning and then in the afternoon so that they're able to transfer information with each other to um, get up to date on any new changes that might be happening for instance, with the New Hampshire court system and um, access to forums, um, various community resources. So that has gone pretty smoothly for us and um, the advocates at WISE, similar to what Deb Mawson said, we have an advocate who's working with child protection, we have an advocate on the Dartmouth campus, um, we have a housing advocate, um, we have a generalist advocate who's keeping track of resources. They're all able to continue to exchange information with each other and to support survivors. The other thing that we have been able to um, take advantage of in ways that we never would have um, expected when we went remote was our robust community volunteer advocate pool. Um, WISE has 37 active um, vol trained volunteers and these volunteers have been providing um, both on-call support um, 24 hours a day, so certainly after hours, which for us would be 4.30, but also throughout the day um, if the staff are busy supporting people um, as they would regularly during the day. Um, this allows for our answering service to be able to connect with people as quickly as possible or for us to monitor web chat and text messaging, which I'll speak about in a minute. So um, a huge um, critical piece is being able to um, have community members provide an extension of the 24-hour advocacy that our, our coalition programs are offering. The other thing that we were able to put in place pretty, pretty quickly was we got a call from Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, which is the major medical center in our community, along with Alice Pack Day, the Veterans Administration Hospital, and another hospital over in Vermont. Um, Dartmouth Hitchcock called us, Janet Carroll, who some may be familiar with, she's the SANE coordinator at the coalition, and also SANE nurse extraordinaire at DH. She reached out and said, I have a ridiculous ask of you, but I'm gonna ask anyways. If, if we need to have a wise advocate come into DH under an extreme circumstance to support a patient during COVID, would you be willing to do that? And I have to tell, I just want the legislators to know um, how supportive the community is of this work. We had 15 people within a couple of hours who agreed to meet this special volunteer need to go into the hospital. We haven't had to access it um, quite yet, 
although we are getting calls from the hospital and they are using telephonic support to provide to patients who are showing up at Dartmouth Hitchcock. The other thing that I would share is um, along with the other crisis centers across New Hampshire and the New Hampshire Coalition, one of the challenges that we realized we had very early on was how do we let people know that we're still here? That um, even though our, our co-location, our main center in Lebanon and our other co-location sites are closed, how do we make sure that survivors and community partners and law enforcement and hospital personnel, how do they know that we're still accessible? So we launched uh, a pretty extensive communications campaign that reinforces that we're here, we're always here 24 seven, and we just have some adaptations in how we do that. We also launched web chat, which you can access through our website. And that is a service that's um, accessible for people who may not be able to use the phone. And I'm sure others of my colleagues will explain why using the phone can be really challenging and problematic for survivors. We also have text messaging capacity. We're not widely um, advertising that at the moment as we work out some kinks, but there is a group of Upper Valley based programs um, that are putting a lot of information out to the community and that text messaging capacity is up there um, for folks to access. The other thing that I would just say before I close is that um, our prevention education program is really a big part of how we reach out to the community. The prevention education program is working in the background to make sure all the information is available for us to send out to the community. They're still engaging with the schools and providing support to teachers and to parents, and to students. And we've also reached out with advertising and outreach awareness to folks. And then lastly, as I close, I just wanna share that um, sort of a shout out to the New Hampshire court system that um, the court clerk in Lebanon has been extremely helpful to us at WISE. She's made a point of telling advocates to let, a, to let her know if someone goes forward with an email petition that she can be on the lookout for it and facilitate it, getting it in front of the judge quickly. Um, we are so appreciative of how our local court in Lebanon has been working with WISE and has been doing their part to make sure that people have access to protection orders if needed. So I'm gonna close and I look forward to any questions that folks may have. Um, really appreciative to the coalition, to my colleagues across the state, I would want the legislators to know we don't do this work alone, we do it together. And that not only leverages federal and state dollars, but ensures a safety net for survivors across the state. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peggy. I think um, one of the values of conversations like this and one of the things it really highlights is how adaptable crisis centers are. And I think that strength has shown through in really unprecedented ways in the face of this pandemic. Um, I just, as we transition, I want to note that um, um, Representative Griffith asked a question um, if there is a way that folks who might be listening um, can become active as volunteers. And we will certainly send that out after this, but folks should know you are welcome to read out, reach out to the coalition on our website, which will be in the contact information, or contact your local crisis center and we'll make sure to get you connected if you're interested in engaging in volunteer work. So I'm really glad that Peggy talked about that.